Noisy brakes are probably one of the most common concerns that I've heard throughout my career. My brakes squeak, my brakes grind, my brakes go when I try and stop. And when people make the noise, it's my absolute favorite. We are going to be putting all new brakes on the Miata, but rather than just slapping a whole bunch of new parts on it, we're gonna go over how to do a proper brake inspection some common causes for brake noise, and some steps that may get overlooked when we're really trying to get the best possible performance out of our brakes. Big ups to Advanced Auto Parts for teaming up with us on this video. Today, we are going to be installing CarQuest Platinum brake pads and CarQuest OE replacement rotors. And fun fact, they track test these Platinum pads. So you're probably wondering, Charles, why aren't you doing a big brake kit on this Miata? Well, remember, we're building it for street class for autocross, so we can't do a big brake kit yet. When you push your foot on your brake pedal, you are pushing a piston. This piston pushes fluid through the brake hydraulic system. That force acts against the back of the caliper piston, causing the caliper to squeeze the brake pads into the brake rotor. This creates friction. The friction will slow down our wheel and then of course slow down our car. There are times where a tiny bit of extra brake noise is totally normal. Think first thing in the morning when you hit those brakes, you're actually cleaning a little bit of surface oxidation off the rotor. This is a totally normal condition and can happen even with brand new brakes. The brakes we're looking at here on the Miata, however, are not totally normal, and this layer of oxidation needs to be addressed. Brake noise is typically broken down into three different categories, squealing, grinding, and a clunk. Let's start with squealing. This can be a sign of a couple of different issues. The most common one is actually an indicator that your brakes may simply be worn out. Many brake pads have a small tab attached that function as a wear indicator. When your brakes wear to a certain point, this small metal tab, which I lovingly call a squealer, will actually make a little bit of contact with the rotor to alert the driver, alert the mechanic, or sometimes everyone else standing nearby that the brakes are worn out and it's time to replace them. We can have things like incorrect pad to rotor contact. The rust on this brake rotor is actually preventing the friction material of the pad to make good solid contact. When we push the brakes, rather than the pad contacting the rotor, it's like a third contacting rust. We can also get some squealing noise from things like overheating our brakes, the brake pad sticking to the rotor after we let off the brakes, damage to the shim or the backing plate like this, or any of the hardware can cause our brake pad to stick onto the rotor. I've even seen brake pads stall backwards, which usually start as a squeal and then end up causing a grinding noise. When it comes to grinding, this is typically a much worse condition than a simple squeal and is often caused by metal to metal contact. The two most common ones are going to be totally worn out brakes and some kind of outside influence. The other grinding issue that's most common sounds really scary, sounds really bad, but is usually not that big of a deal and that's some sort of outside influence, most typically a rock caught between the rotor and the backing plate. And while this can scuff up the rotor a little bit, it's typically not enough to warrant replacement. Sometimes it's really easy to find that rock and get it loose. I've had other times where I've had to completely take apart the assembly in order to get the rock out. When it comes to clunking when we're either pressing our brake or letting off of our brake, we're going to inspect the brake assembly, but we need to also pay attention to other things that are in that corner of the vehicle. A pad not sitting in the brake caliper bracket properly. A piece of guide hardware that's maybe damaged or fallen out. The incorrect pad can all cause the brake pad to shift inside that caliper bracket. But we need to make sure we're looking at the suspension and wheel bearings as well. A worn out control arm bushing can cause the whole wheel assembly to shift, and that can make a very similar noise to a brake clunking noise. No matter which one of these noise concerns we're experiencing, we're going to be doing a visual inspection, and then we're going to be doing a test drive. This first visual inspection is typically done with the wheels on, depending on what kind of wheel you have. If you don't have big open spaces in your wheel, unfortunately you're going to have to take the wheel off to do the inspection. If that's the case, I'd start with the test drive first. Here's what I look for when I do my initial visual inspection. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to look at the rotor. I'm looking to see how much rust is built up on the surface where the pad rides. As you can see on the Miata, there's a lot of rust on there. That's gonna lead to poor brake performance. I'm looking for obvious signs of metal to metal contact. This may show itself as a bright ring somewhere in the rotor. That may be due to a foreign object in the brake or it may just be due to our brake pads being severely worn out. I'm also looking to see how much friction material 
is left on the pads. It's usually very easy to see the outboard pad and how much friction material is left. The inboard pad is a little bit trickier and you're probably going to need a mirror in order to see the friction material. And on some cars, even with the mirror, it's really tough to see. On many caliper designs, the inside pad is what hits the rotor first. And so a lot of times that inner pad will wear a bit faster than the outer pad. I'm looking for anything loose or missing. This could be a little hard to tell. On this car, for example, if the top guide was there and the bottom one wasn't, that's usually a sign of something fell out or wasn't installed when the brakes were replaced. When looking at the rotor, we really wanna look at how much contact surface the pad is making to the rotor. If you can get behind the wheel, we wanna look at the caliper and we wanna look at the brake lines. We're looking for things on the brake line, like any bulging or cracking of the line. We're looking for brake fluid leaks or obviously loose hardware on the caliper. For the rear, not a bad idea to slide underneath the car with a flashlight. Take a look at the parking brake cables. Make sure that the outside sheathing is not all bunched up. And we can usually test the parking brake pretty easy just by using it and seeing if it holds the car. Now, if you have drum brakes, you're gonna be pretty limited on what you can actually inspect without taking it apart. Now on our brake inspection test drive, I'm checking for three different things. I'm listening for noise, I'm feeling for vibration, and I'm feeling for whether the vehicle pulls either when I press the brake or when I let off the brake. I do this with three levels of brake application. I do it with light brake, think 10% or so of pressing the brake pedal. I do it with moderate brake pedal pressure, which is gonna be like 40 to 60%, or what I think of as just normal braking. Then I do it with full on all the brakes you can get. Of course, before you do that one, make sure you're being safe. Certain noises and certain vibrations can present themselves at different pedal pressure. When we're doing these three levels of braking, we wanna make sure we're listening. Is it coming from the front? Is it coming from the rear? A lot of times the front brakes are gonna make more noise or have more of an issue under heavy braking. When it comes to vibration, we're gonna do the same thing. When we press the brakes and we feel the steering wheel vibrating, that typically means that we have an issue with the front rotors. Now, oftentimes we refer to that as having a warped rotor. That's not technically accurate. The more accurate way to call it is excessive lateral runout, even though a warped rotor is what most everyone in the automotive industry calls it. All this really means is we have high spots and low spots in the rotor causing that vibration. With the rest of the car, or you really feel it in the seat, it's usually the rear rotors that are going to be the issue. It's important to remember too that there are other things that can cause a vibration. Tires, an axle, incorrect torque on a wheel. Even a bad wheel bearing can cause some of these similar kind of things. I swear the newer cars get, the weirder wheel bearing failure is. Now when it comes to pulling, we need to pay special attention. If we hit the brakes and the car juts to the side, we have a problem. If when we let off the brake, the car does the same thing, we have a problem. We have maybe a pad that's not connecting to the rotor at all, or a pad that's sticking, causing the car to pull. We wanna make sure we make note of all these things so that when we do our inspection with the car up in the air, we're paying extra close attention to that kind of stuff. Finally, on the test drive, as you drive more and do more aggressive braking, if the noise starts to go away, it might just be something as simple as brake dust buildup. And once those brakes cool down, if you clean them off, your noise is taken care of. On our in-depth inspection, before we take our wheels off, I like to rotate them by hand and listen for any noise. This may help us isolate which corner of the vehicle is having the problem. Next, we're gonna remove the wheel. We are going to inspect the surface of the wheel where it mates to the rotor. We're also going to inspect the rotor where it mates to the wheel. Surface rust or debris can be a source of a vibration. With the wheel off, do a quick visual inspection. Make sure we don't have any foreign materials like rocks or any metal to metal contact like the backing plate hitting the rotor. The backing plate hitting the rotor is another common cause of brake noise. Next, we are going to remove the caliper and inspect it. We are going to inspect the caliper piston for rust and for damage. We are going to inspect the boot around the piston, make sure there's no rips, and make sure that there's no brake fluid leaking from the seal behind it. We're going to inspect the housing of the caliper make sure there's no damage or brake fluid leaks anywhere else. We're going to inspect our slide pins for any scoring, any wear. We wanna make sure that they're not bent. A straight edge is an amazing tool for that job. And we wanna look at the dust boots for the slide pins. It should take kind of a fair amount of force to get them to pop off either the slide pin or the caliper. 
while we're doing this inspection, if we find anything that we're not 100% confident in or we're not sure about, go ahead and replace it. There is no need to be a hero and try and salvage some of these brake parts that may not be worth salvaging. Next, let's remove the pads. Few things we're looking for here uneven pad wear. A little bit of difference in pad wear is not that big of a deal, but if on this top section of the pad we had eight millimeters of pad and the bottom we had two millimeters of pad, that would be an issue. If the outboard pad is pretty even at eight millimeters and the inboard pad is metal to metal, we may have a caliper or caliper carrier bracket issue. We're going to look at the backing plate condition. As we can see on this one, this backing plate has slid down to the bottom of the pad. This could be a source of noise. This could also cause the brake pad not to fully seat in the rotor. It also looks like the guide hardware was actually hitting this backing plate or the shim plate on the brake pad. So this could cause our brake pad to hang and cause some uneven wear. We also wanna look at the pad where it rides on the guide hardware. This is where I noticed that the backing plate was actually shoved into the hardware. Now, if you're doing a brake job, these parts are really recommended to be replaced. Most of the time, there's no sense in reusing them, but it's really important to know if you had an issue with the current set of brakes. Next, let's do an inspection on the brake caliper carrier. These typically have a lot of brake dust buildup on them, so when we go back together, cleaning is going to be vital. We want to make sure we're looking for any rust buildup, any damage to the metal. We're looking at the condition of our hardware to be sure that our hardware was installed properly. We're also looking at the surface where the pad rides. Now this pad rides on clips on the caliper carrier bracket. So the inspection of the hardware is very important. Not all cars have these shims or this hardware with them. They ride directly on the caliper bracket. We wanna do a thorough inspection on that surface where the pad rides to be sure that there isn't any metal damage. What I've seen happen is the metal actually gets pushed up where the pad rides and it can prevent the pad from fully seating into our brake rotor. We also wanna look at where the brake caliper bracket mounts. Make sure there's no rust or damage. Make sure the threads in the hub are also good. Now we have full view and we can do a good inspection on our rotor. We're looking for any glazing and overheating. Overheating kinda looks cool because it will turn the rotor blue. We're looking for rust and this is like the perfect example of what a rusty rotor looks like. When we remove the rotor, we wanna do these same checks on the back side, be sure there was no metal to metal contact and inspect for rust on that side. We also wanna look at where the rotor mounts to the wheel hub. These two surfaces really do need to be cleaned. We're not gonna spend any time cleaning this old rotor, but we are gonna clean this wheel hub surface. If you are chasing a brake vibration or you wanted to determine whether your vibration was caused by the rotor having excessive lateral runout or perhaps a wheel bearing issue, we can break out the dial indicator and measure the rotor runout. This will measure high spots and low spots in the brake rotor and can help us identify the source of a vibration. Sometimes doing it just on the rotor is enough. If you're trying to chase a wheel bearing, you may need to take the rotor off and measure that runout on the bearing. As we go back together with our new brakes, let's talk about some of the commonly overlooked steps on brake jobs. The first one is cleaning everything. A clean brake job is a happy brake job. Now, we're not rebuilding a high performance engine, but we wanna make sure we're doing a good job cleaning. We wanna make sure we clean the wheel hub where the rotor mounts. We wanna make sure we clean the caliper. If there was a bunch of anti-squeal on the brake caliper, either on the piston or on the other side, make sure you clean that. We wanna make sure we clean our caliper carrier. We need a good clean surface for our hardware to reinstall on. I actually love media blasting these, but a wire wheel or a wire brush work pretty well too. We wanna make sure that we clean our new rotors. Even though these are brand new, we need to go ahead and clean them. A lot of times rotors come with a coating on them to prevent them from rusting while they're in the packaging. A little bit of brake clean on a rag works really, really well, or soap and water work good too. Another thing that's often overlooked is replacing the hardware. Installing new pads and new rotors, but using the same old guide clips is a bad choice. They can become worn or deformed over time, and since we're doing new everything else, we wanna make sure we replace them. A lot of times they come with your new pads anyway, so it's not a big deal. However, if they don't come with your new pads, it's usually just a few bucks more to do the job the right way. This also applies to any bolts that you might remove that are one-time use only. And any of those bolts that you take off, you wanna make sure that you torque them down properly. Also, make sure that if any of this hardware 
requires either thread locker or lubricant or anti-seize that you're putting it on in the right place. This is where referring to the repair manual is a wonderful idea. None of our hardware required any thread locker, but it did require lubricant on the caliper piston where it hits the brake pad, on the opposite side of the caliper where it hits the brake pad, and a small amount where the pad rides on our clips. You don't need a lot here and you really don't need to coat the entire back of the brake pad with this stuff. Just a little bit goes a long way. And of course, when we put our slide pins back in, we wanna make sure that we clean and lubricate those as well. Another thing I see overlooked often is brake fluid service. Brake fluid is a vital part of maintenance on your brakes. Brake fluid is hygroscopic, which means that it attracts and holds water. This is a good thing because then we don't just have straight water settling and rusting our brake lines, but that moisture does build up in the fluid over time and can impact how the brake fluid performs changes the boiling point. Then we actually run the risk of having like a mushy brake pedal. Most manufacturers recommend every two years. A lot of times if you're doing a brake job, unless you've just done it, this is a pretty inexpensive and pretty easy thing to do. Go ahead and replace that brake fluid. And if you're doing any kind of high performance driving, even something like autocross, good idea to go ahead and replace it a little more often. This one is probably the one I see skipped the most and that is bedding in your brake pads. To get the most out of your new brakes, gotta make sure you bed them in properly. This is sort of like a break-in period for your new brakes. Depending on what kind of brakes you install on the car will depend on what this process looks like and be sure to refer to the brake pad manufacturer for their exact bed-in procedure. It typically involves a gradual buildup of heat in the pad and in the rotor. We do a couple of low speed stops, let them cool for a second, moderate speed stops, and then higher speed stops. This puts a very thin layer on the rotor called a transfer film. And we wanna make sure that we have that layer nice and even for the best possible brake performance. Failure to bed in your brakes can lead to noise and vibration. Nothing worse than spending all this time and energy putting new brakes on just to have brake noise right away afterwards. It's important to note too that some brake pads can actually take up to 400 miles or so to fully develop that film. And of course, if you're doing this just on the street, you gotta be extra careful for everyone around you. Now there's one final thing I gotta say because it wouldn't be a break anything without talking about this, and that is always, always, always pump the brake. In fact, I'm at the point now where anytime I get into car, no matter what, I pump the brake pedal. Thankfully, this is a pretty rarely overlooked thing, but I have seen no less than three times in a professional shop where the brakes weren't pumped to fully seat the caliper and pad into the rotor and it caused issues. Two times, seen toolboxes smashed. Thankfully, no one was hurt. I did, however, see one time where someone did get hurt. Luckily, they were okay, it wasn't a huge deal. But for real, this is something you wanna make sure that you do every time. All right, with one more corner to go, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up there. Guys, what else do you look for when you're doing a brake job? With that, I'm out. Have an awesome day and I'll talk to you again next time. Ooh. Ouchie.